Ladies and gentlemen, our next and last workshop of the day on paving the way to better relationships uh, will be run by Dr. Omar Mahmoud on the art of communication. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Omar on to the stage. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammad. Allah maftah alayna bi hikmatika wa anshur alayna bi rahmatika ya adhan jilani wa nikram. Rabbish rahli sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Um, so, we'll be discussing the art of communication and um, of course this is a huge topic. I don't think we can really cover all of it in uh, this short time, but we'll try to hit on some important points um, and particularly questions that you know people have about their relationships, um, people close to them in their life, or trying to form new relationships and how to get close to people and how this can be done um, in an effective way. So, can we, um, the next slide? We can start, let's at least remember the prophetic example. This one is always something that very, I find very powerful. It struck me the way um, Anas radiallahu an describes the Prophet sallallahu This is a hadith, a famous hadith uh, from the Shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi in which he described a bunch of characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu so, Sheikh Abu Zaki was, you know, suggesting that we learn about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa read about him. One of, the, one of the most powerful ways to read about him is to read the Shama'il, which are descriptions of the Prophet sallallahu In the Shama'il, they talk about, you know, even the physical description of the Prophet, how he looked, what his face was like, what his body was like, his hair was like, what were his mannerisms, what was his behavior like, his speech, and these type of things. <laughs> And then even how he interacted with people. So this is um, Anas radiallahu an, who you know was a small boy when he first met the Prophet sallallahu and actually became a, kind of a servant for a little while for the Prophet sallallahu for a good part of his life. So he grew up in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Anas radiallahu an who says. <coughs> خدمت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عشر سنين فما قال لي أف قط. I served the messenger of God for ten years. For ten years I served him, and he never once said the word uff to me. So when the Arabs describe this word uff, what they mean is it's like a, a word of uh, frustration or disrespect or kind of anger, like, you know, scolding someone a little bit. And it's not a long word. It's just, oof, you know, it's just kind of like showing frustration and anger to somebody. So he didn't even show that is what Ennis is saying. He never even said that kind of word, let alone scolding me and, you know, being angry with me and maybe lecturing me and things like that. He never did that. He said, I served him for 10 years and he never did that. وما قال لي لشيء فما وما قال لي لشيء وما قال لي لشيء صنعته لما صنعته ولا لشيء تركته لما تركته. And he never said to me, if I did something, the messenger of God. He never said to me, if I did something, why did you do that? And if I forgot to do something, he never said to me, hey, why didn't you do that? So again, here he is, he's learning from the Prophet ﷺ, and in a different hadith, Anas describes the Prophet ﷺ as, as you know, one of the best teachers, or the best teacher he ever had. Um, so if the Prophet ﷺ is teaching you things and guiding you, how does he do it without giving you all these corrective statements, you know? He's not getting angry when you mess up. And if you do something wrong, he's not saying, hey, why did you do that? Or if you didn't do something, he doesn't say, hey, how come you didn't do this? These are normal statements that we usually end up saying when someone is under your care, right? If you're mentoring someone, if you're teaching them, if you have a child, or you have someone that you're kind of trying to give them knowledge, usually at some point they're going to mess up because human beings are imperfect. 
And then you get frustrated and you say, hey, why didn't you do that? I told you to do this. How come you didn't do it? But the Prophet ﷺ, he never said anything like that to Anas. Um, so, which is amazing to me because he was 10 years in his house. You would think even at some point in 10 years, something would have gone wrong. You know, Anas would have made some mistake. He was just a kid. He must have made some mistakes. But despite that, he never got scolded. Um, and that is very valuable to think about because um, what is what is it that we learn? You know, that that's something to think about. What is it that we learn when you're being scolded or when you're being lectured or when you're being di talked to in that manner? He says, "Woman, uh, men, wa kana Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam." He was the best of people in character. And this is this is gets into another description of, of the Prophet, but Anna says, I never touched any any cloth, any silk, any kind of soft um, material that was more tender or more soft than the hand of the Prophet And he says, I never smelled any misk, any kind of itr, any kind of perfume that was more fragrant than the sweat of the Messenger of God. I think that's important because that part reminds you that he was not a normal human being. You know, he was a human, but he was unlike any other human. Um, and that's a, an important reminder. You know, it's a, a diamond is also a stone like any other stone, but a diamond is clearly different than the other stones. So the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he was a man, but he was unlike any other man. And Anas says he learned a lot from him, but during that whole time, he never got that kind of angry talk from the Prophet And so he never said, oof, he never got frustrated with me. If I, you know, if, think about a small kid, you know, working for you, like he's going to break something. Something will, he'll, he's going to misplace something. He's going to forget to do something. And in all those situations, you don't show him any frustration or anger. And then he says, if I did something, he didn't ask me, why did you do that? Or if I forgot to do something, if I didn't do it, he didn't, say, he didn't say, why didn't you do that? Why? Because there's no purpose to that question. The question doesn't help you at that moment. So, you know, it's like if you send your spouse, and usually it's the husband, you send him to the store to buy something, and he comes back, you know, with some other random thing that was not on the list, and everything on the list is not on the, when he bought it. And so you say, hey, why did you do that? And you already know the reason why he did it. He probably either forgot or he was not concentrating. It's very, there's only a few possibilities, right? It's, you know, there's, we already know the answer to the question. The only reason we ask the question is to just dig a little bit deeper in the person to make them know that they messed up. You already know, you've known this person for a long time. You know they're going to mess up. So when you ask, hey, why didn't you do this? The only purpose of that question is to harm the person, to make them feel guilty. They know. And usually if, they, if their intellect is okay, they're even already embarrassed by the time they come home. They know, they already know they messed up. So even your, you don't even really need to punish them because they've already punished themselves in their own mind. They know. And um, so that's interesting because sometimes we, the things we do in communication, we're not even using it for the right purpose. We're, we're doing it because of our own emotions. Maybe we're frustrated, we're upset, so we say something. It has no use except to hurt the other person or at least just get rid of my own frustration. But functionally, it's not useful in that moment. Most people who are... If they understand the rules, and they again, we're assuming someone has a normal intellect. If somebody is a little bit, you know, not that, you know, not that quick or not that smart, you know, that's different. That's a different situation. But 
the average person, they, they know what, what they were supposed to do if they were given an assignment and they didn't do it. They, they'll know. And um, you kind of jumping on that point and hitting it so many times and repeating it, it doesn't have any purpose to improve the situation. You're not going to suddenly make the stuff they forgot appear, right? The stuff, he went to the store and came back and it's, by you scolding him, it's, all that stuff is not going to appear suddenly. It doesn't solve the problem. It would be better just for him to go back to the store and get it, you know, and come back. So um, that's just an example. This is the prophetic example of um, communication. And you would imagine then he's not correcting much. So how is he teaching? Um, so there's three levels of communication in when you talk about when you're dealing with people verbally or in an interaction. You have the vocabulary that you're using, the inflections of your voice, and then you have nonverbal behavior. These are the three main things. If I come up to you and I talk to you, or you come up to someone and you, your friend and you guys are starting to talk, there's three things that are being used to convey the information. What words have you chosen? How, are you, how is your voice? You know, is your voice going up, going down? And then what's, what's your, all your other nonverbal things you're doing at that moment? Um, and so that's, that's, that's very interesting to think about. Um, how much, you know, would you guys, would, do you think each of these, um, is important in communication. Um, in other words, which one do you think is the most in terms of sending the message? Number three, nonverbal. Yes. What's number two? Voice inflection is the second. The least amount of information comes from the actual words you use, the vocabulary. Um, so if you look at the next slide, we have the, it's about 7% of what we communicate is based on vocabulary. 38% is voice inflections and 55% is based on nonverbal behavior. Um, so vocabulary is pretty clear. That's just the meanings of the words you're choosing. What do we mean by voice inflection? Um, let's see, um, can I get a volunteer who, who can come up, um, and do a little exercise with me? So, come on down. So, what's your name, brother? Matthew. Matthew, okay, nice to meet you. So, we'll start very simple. Let's say a single word, okay? So, somebody asks you a question, and I'd like you to say the word no, but you're very sure that the answer is no. How would you say it? No. <laughs> that sounded very convincing. Now, say it again, but you're actually not sure if this is the right answer. No. <laughs> you see the difference? Um, and um, good. I'm not going to ask you how you would say it if you knew the answer was yes, but you wanted to say no. But that's another, that's another cue. Um, so, okay, good. Do you understand that just by the change in the inflection, you change a lot of the meaning? And sometimes that's why it's so important. You're conveying a lot more than just one word. Okay. Um, stay here, Matthew. I need another volunteer to interact with Matthew. Anybody, please? What's your name, brother? Ryan. Ryan. Okay. I got Ryan and Matthew. What's going on here? <laughs> All right. Where are you guys from? Most recently, Indonesia. Okay. How about you? Most recently, KL. Oh, okay. <laughs> now I'm totally confused, <laughs> but uh, that's fine. Um, so let's see. I want, um, I'd like, Ryan, I'd like you to tell Matthew, let's think of a scenario. Um, you... Um, you 
you, let's see, you, you need to study for a test um, tomorrow, and you're worried about how you're going to do on this test, I'm going to give you all the background, okay? You're going to study, you need to study for a test, you're worried about how you're going to do, um, and it's, it's one of the most important classes that you're taking, and it's also um, something that you, the previous test you kind of didn't do that well on, so this test is even more important for you, and there's, so there's a lot of stress associated with this. You, it's, a, it's basically your career choice that, that's going to happen here, um, and at the same time, a lot of people, like your friends and family, are telling you that they don't even think this is right for you, that you're going to do well in this field. You know, so there's a lot going on. I want you to tell all of that to Matthew in one sentence. In other words, you're going to have to summarize a lot. <laughs> and you'll and you have, you have to cut out a lot, too. This test is the most important hour of my entire life. That was really good. That was really good. So, do you understand? There was a lot to ex convey, but time is limited, right? So... There's, there's not as much that you can put, but the way he phrased it and the tone of voice laid a lot of heaviness to it, right? Um, okay, Matthew, I'd like you to convey to him that um, you are in a lot of pain. You have probably something medically happened to you and just recently, and you um, really need to go to the hospital, um, and you want him to help you. And I, you have two words. Please help. <laughs> good, <laughs> very good. So he's 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 emotive. He's trying to get you to, you know. Do something, and you know, maybe it would have been good to say hospital. Like I would, maybe I would have said, please hospital or something like that. But he understands that he knows he's got to help you, and and you know, aid, come to your aid right away. So again, um, content is very important, but you don't always have the luxury of content. So you have to convey things in other ways. Sometimes you have limited time. Sometimes you have limited um, exposure, uh, and you know, things are urgent. Let's see. Ryan, is there any way that you can um, explain to Matthew that you are s extremely happy because of something, some great news you just had in your life? And I don't want you to use any words. <laughs> maybe, maybe gestures, I don't know. <laughs> All right. That was good. All right, guys. Give them a hand. And, uh, thank you so much. I noticed Ryan was a little subdued there. That tells us a lot, too, maybe about his personality and what he wants to express or not. Um, but no, that's, that's so the reason I'm, we're doing that example is just to see, you know, that Language and communication is much more than just what you say. Like, if you were just to have somebody transcribing this, they'd have no idea what was going on. You know, like if someone was just typing this and then gives you the text, you no video, no audio. All you just saw was a text. This would be like the weird, strange conversation, you know? Like, a lot of stuff is missed simply through text. So um, that's one of the reasons why text messaging can be one of the worst things possible you know, WhatsApp messages or text messages, because you don't really know half of what you're saying is not being said to the other person. And there's always funny situations where people misinterpret texts. They think you're angry and you are just joking. And then they come back at you with something more angry and you think they're joking. So you add more and it just increases. And at the end of the day, you know, whole friendships are lost based on just misunderstanding of texts. You know, that, that's why it's, it's kind of dangerous, you know, to, to do too much with texts. You know, I notice some people, though, they prefer sending texts than communicating. And I think it's because 
the voice inflection and the nonverbal stuff also makes people uncomfortable, right? It's not always the easiest thing. So you prefer, let me just send a text and let them figure it out, you know? Um, but um, the, down, the downside to that is it's not as clear. And sometimes, you know, my wife and I will be texting back and forth. She wants me to do something. I can't fully figure out what it is, and I'm responding back. And then at some point I say, like, forget it. Let's, I just call her, you know, I have to talk to you because this is, we're not able to communicate. What is it you want? And then the talk is we're done in 30 seconds. We figure it out and we're done. Um, so, you know, the idea that there's so much more to communication um, than what you, what you simply say. I liked what um, Baraka Blue mentioned. One of the advice of his teachers was when you're doing da'wah, don't use very many words. In fact, avoid words unless it's absolutely necessary. Because you don't, they're the smallest percentage of what you're communicating to someone, the actual words that you choose. So this is a famous statement um, that goes along those lines. They, t they used to tell us this in Yemen a lot. Lisan al-hal afsah min lisan al-maqal. The tongue of your state is much more eloquent than the spoken tongue. The things that you say, you can be very, very eloquent and very poetic and you can say a lot of things, but your actual state of being is going to be much more eloquent than that. It's going to say things with more meaning than that. Now, the positive side of that is, you know, if somebody has really good character, really good behavior or really prophetic practice, then they don't really have to say much. They, it's on them. As soon as you see their behavior, you see how they act, how they interact with people, you know that this is something special. You know, there's so many stories of the awliya, of the, of the great righteous people who didn't say much, but people just saw them and decided, wow, I don't even know what this person believes in, but I want to believe in it too. I want to know what, how, what it is they have that I'm, I don't, I've never seen that before. That's the power of the state. Of being. That's, of course, the greatest example of that was the Prophet. You know, one of, the, um, one of the people of Medina who was suspicious if this really was a Prophet, he said the day that he, but the moment he saw the Messenger of God, he said, I knew as soon as I saw his face that this was not a liar. So just the state of the Prophet ﷺ conveyed so much meaning that you didn't really, even though he was the most eloquent of people, he could, in his words, probably convince you of anything, but he didn't need to. Um, so keeping that in mind when we're interacting with each other, the positive side is if you have positive characteristics or you're trying to teach someone positive things, it's, it's your state that's going to be much more um, powerful, impactful. The danger side of it is, what if your speech contradicts your state, you know? Parents will sometimes tell their children, do this, do this, and do this, and their state is, the, parent, the kid is not listening to what you're saying, the kid is watching your behavior. So if you're telling the kid, hey, don't, get, you don't yell at your sister, and then you're yelling at your spouse, the kid is going to learn from your, your example. The kid is not going to listen to these words you're saying because the, clearly the words are not that meaningful in your own life if you're not able to practice. So some parents will say, just do what I say, not what I do, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes that's, that's possible, but um, it's not, um, you know, it's not always easy. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect. You can admit your own shortcomings, but then that has to be communicated. You know, sometimes I'll tell, you know, my son, if I'm telling him to do something, he say, but Baba, you know what, you did this. And I say, you know what, you're right. I need to fix it too. Uh, you know, I, you're right. I don't want to just be hip hypocritical. Thank you for showing me that, you know, I have to work on things too. Um, and that, I think, is more powerful. That's more impactful on the other person. Because it's not about, you know, showing how perfect you are. We're just, we're all trying to get to a certain journey along the way. And so we can mutually help each other out. Um, so with that being said, we can't avoid the words, you know. It's not like we can all just be nonverbal. You know, we need words at some point.
You know, for example, some of the examples between Matthew and Ryan when we're doing the exercise, you know, some things he didn't have to say, like he needs help, he could just say help and let's go. But other things, you know, the scenario where I asked Ryan to describe the test and how important it is and all these things behind it, there's certain, he just he has to say certain words. I, if I told him to do that in one word, it'd be impossible. But he has to mention the test and, and how it's important and stuff. So, in other words, there's some things that you do have to use the words for. And if you don't use the words, people are not going to know what you're talking about. So sometimes we assume, oh, I'm interacting with someone. They should be able to understand it. They should get it. But did you use the, the exact words that you should have said? No. And then they're like, well, how could I know? The other side of it is not everybody is very good at interpreting communication. You know, so in my, in my line of practice in psychology, there's, you know, we see every once in a while a, a number of people, they have communication, you know, impairment. They're unable to communicate normally or understand all the social consequences or social context. <clears throat> the biggest example of that is like autism spectrum. People who are in the autism spectrum, they don't really understand social cues sometimes. And if you try to give them nonverbal cues or you try to let them know, you try to say something sarcastically, they may take it literally. Um, if you try to describe something in a joke, they may think you're being serious. They don't know. Um, so that's, an, that's a more, you know, less common example. But there are many examples in society where people don't know how to interpret these signs. And so, you know, you got, you got to be careful about that. There was a bro young brother in, in uh, university. He was, after the banquet that the Muslim students were putting together, he was gathering all the tables and all the, the flowers that were on the table. At the end of the day, <clears throat> he gathered them all, all up. And there was a, one of the sisters in the Muslim group, he, he gave her all the, the flowers to, like, you know, take to the room or something. And she interpreted it into something else, you know. He didn't say anything, and she didn't know what was going on. So it was a funny scenario, but you can see what I'm saying. Like, sometimes people interpret the message totally different than what you intended. And you have to be aware of that. And so those people might, may require more specific language. Because they just don't, they don't get it. They don't, unless you say it literally, they, don't, maybe not, they may not be able to interpret it. It's possible. So you have to understand people have different styles of communication as well. Other people are very good at nonverbal. They don't even need to say much. You know, sometimes you see friends and you ask them, like, how come you guys are so close? You guys are, you don't barely talk to each other. But maybe that's not what they get out of their friendship, you know? I see people, like, I see, you know, there's sometimes I see, like, two people, they're always hanging out together. They're always together. All, I never see them talking. And I think they just have other things that they share about their interaction. All of human interaction is not simply words, you know. You, you exchange things in other ways as well with people. So we're going to do a little questionnaire. I'd like to see what you guys, how you guys listen. Um, because we're talking about interpreting, we're talking about communication. How do you listen? So... If you could just get a piece of paper or you could take your phone and use the calculator and just add up your points. This is the first question. <clears throat> when listening to, other, to another person, I get distracted. For this question, enter your points. One is always, two is usually, three is often, rarely is four, and never would be five points. So just either on a piece of paper or on your phone calculator, just put in the, the first number for that. When listening to other, another person, I get distracted. So think about how often that happens to you. All right? Everybody entered something? All right, let's go to the next. When listening to another person, I listen only to facts. You know, I'm looking just for the fact. I'm not listening for any description, any emotion, whatever. I just want the facts. For you, is that always, usually, often, rarely, or never? So add that to your last one, and you'll get a tally of your points. All right, let's go to the next one. 
when listening to another person, I interrupt. Is that always, usually, often, rarely, or never for you at that point? How many points? The worst is when you have, like, you're in a meeting and there's two people that just constantly interrupt each other. You know, one person's trying to talk, the other person, well, yeah, but well, this, and then this person interrupts, and everybody else is just silent and frustrated, waiting for the meeting to get over. <laughs> Sometimes that would be rarely or usually, depending on how, some, how often your sometimes is. I would imagine often is a little bit more than 50%. This might be 70% of the time, 100% of the time. Rarely might be 25% of the time. <laughs> All right, next one. When listening to another person, I assume the other person already knows. You know, you, already, you assume they already know certain things that, about what you want to say or what what is going on in the situation. So this could be anything, you know, you think about, hey, hey, I have an idea, you know, for this person. I know, I know who, I know somebody who will finally marry this guy. I found her, she looks like this, she, she works here, you know, and you're listening to them. You know, but maybe the guy already, you know, got married or something, you know. And so either... Does he know? I assume he knows, you know, that kind of thing. Do you, do you assume the person knows all the background when you're listening to them? When listening to another person, I prejudge. I already give a judgment of what they're saying already. I kind of know what the whole message is going to be. I, I already know. How often do you do that? And don't worry, you don't have to share your answers with anybody. <laughs> so it's totally confidential. Just add it up on your own. It's really hard too when someone starts a certain story with you and you think, okay, I know where this is going, you know, like I, I know what's going to happen, but you still have to listen all the way till the end, you know, because you don't know. At the end, they could throw in something random and then it changes the whole conclusion. Sometimes you know it's going to be random. <laughs> so when they start talking, you say, oh, I already know. This uh, story is not going to make any sense. <laughs> so that's also prejudgment. All right, one more, I think. One more. When listening to another person, I tune out. So in other words, you're listening, but you're not listening. <laughs> you're just kind of, you're nodding your head. You kind of, you know, thinking you're, you're thinking about something else that happened today. And, you know, you're looking at their face, but not really, you know, kind of looking and nodding. You hear their voice, inflection. You're thinking about what you want to eat and... Where are you going to go tomorrow? And then at the end they say, so what do you think? And then you're stuck because <laughs> you have no idea what they've been talking about. And then you say something like, ah, oh, that's interesting, you know, I don't know. I, I need to think about it some more. Can you send me a text? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And is there one more, I think, uh, before we get to the end? Ah, oh, when listening to another person, I ignore nonverbal cues. You know, I just want the information. I don't try to look at their body language. I don't try to see, you know, what's the expression on the face. Do they seem tense, relaxed? What's going on? How fast are they speaking? That kind of stuff I don't really pay attention to. For me, in, in my line of work as a psychologist, I'm, it's almost the opposite. Like, I sometimes only look at the nonverbal cues and the voice inflection. Like, I'm not... Although I listen to what they're saying, it's not, I really need to know, like, what's your emotional state at that moment, you know? That's more important information for me in, like, a session. Because I can, t how, that'll help me understand, are you currently feeling stressed out, or are you feeling anxious, or are you depressed, that kind of thing? Because those things people don't usually say. Most people just say positive things in, in life, because it's socially acceptable, you know, I had a friend, hey, man, how are you, how's your marriage going? How are things going? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's been divorced for three years. He didn't tell me, you know. He just, he was too embarrassed to tell me, you know, because of the social thing. He's feeling judgment. Maybe it'll be embarrassing, whatever. But we, we tend to say things just to make it seem okay 
So somebody who knows you, they'll pick up on the nonverbal cues. They'll be like, I, okay, how are you doing? I'm fine. Okay, but I could tell something's different, especially if you know the person well. You can pick up on it because you have a lot of comparison to their normal days and their good days and their bad days, so you have enough information in your mind to know. But if you don't know the person, it's harder because they could just be giving you a picture. So look at now, add up all your points. Effective, good, not so good listener. 13 points or less is, huh? That means not listening very much. If you got a score like 72, then something went wrong. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's either ineffective listening or ineffective viewing, I guess. Or just you hit the multiplication button instead of the plus. Um, so just think about um, where you fall on that. Um, I think, you know, we don't actively try to think about what makes us a good listener. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself, by the way. I'm not trying to say that I know how to do this all the time. I'm also a poor listener at times, especially if I'm distracted by something else. Something else is on my mind. I'm not going to be the best listener. And, you know, sometimes I try a technique that I try to use to kind of make it oh, somewhat okay is I, I at least try to listen to the last thing they say. So then I can, I can ask them, oh, so about this thing, you know, can you tell me more? So they, they, uh, they feel like I'm still in the conversation. But if I'm, you know, I'm totally distracted sometimes or have other things going on in my life, I don't know. I don't know if I can focus that well. Um, and if you want to build a relationship with someone or improve a relationship with someone, you have to be an active listener. You have to be very effective. You've got to think about your listening. You've got to be conscious about it. Am I listening in a way that's going to benefit this relationship? And not just the verbal things, but the nonverbal things. Not just the facts, but even the way they describe things. You know, sometimes it's not even what they say. They, say, they may say something, but you, you think to yourself, why did you say it that way? in that way? You know, why did you use this way to say it? You know, so that itself is another message for you to think about. Um, where's, where are we at after this? Is there any other slide? So communication, I think this is my last slide. Is it an art or a science? Because the, the title was supposed to be Art of Communication. Um, but some people may think of it more as a science, you know, than an art. I'd like to get your comments on this. What do you guys think? Is, is communication an art or a science? Okay, first, who thinks it's more of a science? Does anyone? All right, sister, would you mind tell, sharing why you think it is more like a science? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, on my point of view, it is science because science was science is unexplainable things that sometimes, though it's in an art or this is, it comes to the certain certain specific or certain context of the things. Sometimes we in the specific um, feelings, so it becomes a uh, emotion. Sometimes it's, a, it's in a, a specific of things, so it becomes an art. Though it is in the form of scientific method that sometimes uh, no specific answer to be fixed on a specific situation or ideas or circumstances. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. No, I, I mean, I see that point because there are a lot of variables in communication. You guys notice I had a, a different there's different you know, levels of communication. There's different um, data that you're trying to gather. So I can see the science argument for sure. Anyone who thinks it's more of an art. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I would think it would be some sort of art because, you know, for scientific things, it's more likely a tangible item so that we can see, we can touch. As for communication, it's something like intangible. We cannot see it nor touch it, but we have to feel it somehow. So that's why I think it's some sort of art rather than science. I kind of see it as an art in the sense that it's not something that can be reduced to like an equation, that there's always like one way to solve it. It's not something that everyone would necessarily agree uh, on what's optimal communication. 
but it's also somewhat of a science. And one of the ways that it's not like art, I think, is art is something that kind of stands alone, and different people can look at it and think like, "I like this." Other people say, "I don't like this." But when it's communication, if it's between you and another person, you kind of know when you did it right. It's kind of reduced to those two people. That if he, if you, if he got your message, then you succeeded, and it's not something that's really subjective. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I I too also like the idea of it being a combination because then um, there is the sort of intangible part of it, the kind of part that's, um, you know, creative even. You know, you can have different methods of being communi of communicating and be creative. But then there's the, there's the logical side of it, like there's certain things that you need to convey. Um, the idea that about the art side of it, though, too, is I do kind of believe that some people are born with better communication skills than other people, especially if you take into consideration something like like the existence of autism. So we know that there's some conditions where there's, it's very, very difficult to communicate for people. Um, so, or someone who's very shy or introverted, you know, versus someone who's very social and extroverted. There's some individual difference, and even as a young child, you can kind of tell which children are very good at communicating and interacting with us, and other children are more quiet, and it's harder for them to express things. So I do think there's individual differences, and it may even be something you're kind of born with. But from the science side, I do think there's things you can do to always improve your communication. You know, you can always become more effective. You can employ certain techniques, certain methods, you know, certain... Um, variables that you can focus on to be a better communicator and listener. And so that's where the science part of it comes in as well. Um, this is an important thing to think about because for the most part, we're not very conscious of these things. And, uh, you know, another interesting thing is that sometimes silence can be a very powerful tool in communication as well, like where you don't even say anything. Um, and that can be really powerful, especially if you're, if someone, um, you know, is saying something to you and you just be quiet and you just listen to what they have to say and let them have their say. And sometimes that ends the whole situation. Like if it was a, if it was something that could result in conflict, if you had responded and you had said something back, it might've resulted in a conflict. But the fact that you stayed silent and let them speak, um, it actually turned out to be better, you know? Or if you think about if you're upset with someone and you want them to know that you're upset, sometimes your silence is more, you know, deafening to them than you actually saying something back, you know? Sometimes you feel like, you know, you did something wrong to someone and you ask them, you know, I'm sorry or please forgive me and they're very silent. That kills you more, you know, even than anything that they could say back to you. Um, or they only say a few words and then they're done, you know, okay, I accept your apology, that's it, and they're done, and you're wanting more, you think they should say more, but that's it, that's all they want to say, so they're conveying something when they do even silence or a few words, so it doesn't have to be a lot to communicate. Um, so how about we, we have a few minutes left, are there any comments or, you know, reflections that you guys have? about communicating and when we're talking to one another. The reason this, this topic is so important, I think, is because we, we don't think about it a lot, and especially when people form relationships. Um, I think this afternoon session has something to do with marriage, maybe. Is that correct? Like, the theme was somewhere, you know, um, whatever, maybe not. <laughs> but um, the idea that people, um, you know, get married or people form, I guess it could be any kind of relationship, a business relationship, a partnership, anything, and their communication is so key. That's probably the, one of the best predictors of the success of this relationship, is how well do these people communicate. You think your partner, whether it's your, again, let's, if we don't want to say marriage, we could say business partner or education, or somebody that you're going through something with, you think 
the best partner for you is going to be someone who agrees with you, has the same political views as you, same spiritual views, follows the same madhab, the same tariqa, the same this, same watches the same TV shows as you, all these shared interests. And shared interest is good, it's important, it's useful at times, but I'm not sure that's the best predictor of the success of a relationship. I see people who, who have totally opposite personalities, you know, married for like 50 years, you know, and they're just, they understand each other. They know how to communicate with one another. But if you look at their interests and what they do, they're not very, they don't share much in common. You know, so thinking about why is it that um, we, we assume someone's going to be like your successful person to interact with um, and you haven't figured out the communication styles between the two people. So, um, comments and uh, reflections. Assalamu alaikum and Jazakallah khair for your, uh, for your talk. Um, one thing that was interesting I, I read is that um, native English speakers, that is people who grow up speaking English, they found in a business setting they have the worst communication skills in English. I found that very, very amusing actually. And uh, a tool personally that I found is very helpful in my marriage, which is a multicultural marriage, and also in business, which I often deal with, you know, either I'm speaking Bahasa Indonesia, Bahasa Malaysia, or people speaking English with me who are not native speakers, is when I hear something, I say back to them, I listen actively, and then I say back to them, here's what I heard you say. Did I understand you correctly? Right? And, I and maybe 30% of the time, subhanAllah, they say, no, no, not completely the opposite, right? And likewise, when I tell people something, I say, could you please just repeat back to me what you understood? I want to make sure I communicate it effectively. And I found that very, very useful tool in business and in my marriage. And, uh, and the first part, of course, to your point, is you have to actively listen and be an effective listener. Once you've listened, then make sure you understood the, the right thing. No, great points. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair. Yeah, the idea that um, you you think you conveyed something and you hope they understood what you conveyed, but to, it's nice to have the confirmation that, like, no, this is what I understood. And sometimes that recheck is important because you didn't say the thing you wanted to say. You know, you actually... You said the thing you didn't mean to say, you know? So that's another thing where you might have to self-correct and say, oh, no, I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say this instead. So if you don't have a, an active, if both people are not actively communicating and listening, it's going to be difficult. We have one question from the audience. Um, that was written down. So words are, um, it was said in your lecture that words are less important than nonverbal. But people get hurt by words, um, not their tone of voice. So don't we need to be more careful about the, wor about the words that we choose, especially when restraining our anger? It is said that words cannot be taken back once said. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, you know sometimes we try to tell our, our children, you know, if someone teases them at school, oh, you know, words, they don't harm you, they're nothing. Um, you know, it's just, I'm rubber, you're glue, you know, and uh, that's maybe true, but not always. Sometimes words can be very hurtful, and they can be very harmful. Um, I agree with that, and um, it's rare, though, that you see someone say something hurtful in a neutral voice. They usually say it also with a certain tone of voice and a certain expression on their face and maybe body language too. It's very rare that someone just says something in a you know robotic, robotic voice to you. Um, and you know sometimes I do notice like if if you say something to someone if you give them a criticism you know, but you say it in a certain way, they'll be more accepting of it. Even if I use the same exact words and I say it in a mean way, it's going to be more hurtful. And I use the same exact words, but for whatever reason, if you 
put it in a nicer tone and in a way that you're trying to say it out of love or out of you want the best for this person, it's accepted in a different way. So the tone and the, um, the body language and the nonverbal things are very important in the emotion that you're conveying. Um, but you're right, some people use words that are just very, very hurtful and um, they cannot, you, know, you can't take them back. Um, and I find, um, unless again, unless we're talking about someone who, who only understands things very literally, because sometimes you need the nonverbal cue because I notice, for example, you know, some, a man may say to his wife or to someone a statement and he's just saying it as a fact, you know, he's just saying it as a, ref, as an observation, but it comes off as very insulting and his wife or, you know, whoever is receiving that comment takes it as an insult. He didn't mean it as an insult. It's clear by his, his tone and his body language. He didn't mean it as an insult, but the words were very insensitive. You know, that's, that's not a normal compliment. <laughs> you know, most, sometimes he thinks he's giving a compliment. He's actually like hurting the person. Um, so that's why to me, the nonverbal part is very important because that's not, that was not the intention of what he said. Um, and then he needs feedback. Someone needs to explain to him, hey, that's not an appropriate thing to say because people might be insulted by that. So he needs the feedback to know, oh, okay, I didn't know. Like, um, whereas if somebody really wants to hurt you, um, you know, they can, they can hurt you, um, quite deeply with those words or other words, or sometimes no words, or sometimes just one word, you know, right? I mean, if, if your mom says, you know, just the way she says, okay, the word okay, it could be like very hurtful to you because you you know that she's mad at you or something, or it could be a happy thing, you know, so the tone can change it as well. Um, but I, you know, I, I agree. I think it doesn't, it doesn't excuse us from not paying attention to our words. We should pay attention to our words. We should use the best words and understand certain words will be very painful for other people to hear. So how can we, how can we change that or say it in a way that won't be, won't be painful? Thank you very much, Dr. Omar. Big round of applause again. Thank you. Thank you.